Hello, welcome to another special emergency episode of Oh God, What Now? Boris Johnson ruined Christmas for everybody by announcing a Brexit deal on Christmas Eve, thus forcing people to think about Brexit over Christmas. Fortunately, we have with us two people who like nothing better than pouring over an immensely long trade agreement <laughs> over a leftover mince pie and a glass of sherry. <laughs> That's that's their miracle of Christmas. Uh, first, we have Ian Dunt, editor at large at politics.co.uk. Hi, Ian. Hey, man. Hey. How was your break? Well, I mean, it was good while it was happening, and I rather got into it. I was just like, oh, I just I'll just think about food and movies and and wine, and then and then this happened, you know, with with the Brexit stuff, and then it's just like, well, you you absolute criminal bastards, you you, you fucked Christmas. It was just like the logical endpoint. That Brexit has been building to this whole time, but eventually, obviously, it will have to fuck Christmas, and that's what it did this year. We also have Alex Andre. Hi, Alex. How are you? Hello, Joey. And I'm all right. Uh, did you enjoy the way the sort of the press, the right wing press, after giving Boris Johnson a hard time, suddenly went into full North Korea hagiography <laughs> mode, li- literally, <laughs> literally, literally praising his praising his son for making uh, for making hand patterns that look like a dirty protest? Yeah, <laughs> they, I mean. It's quite interesting to read the foreign press over the last couple of days. A couple of them have gone in really quite hard in attacking the British press for what it's doing. And they're saying that basically the press has been the Brexiters' co-conspirator throughout this last decade, really, not interested in whether anything is true or false, just entirely partisan in its assessment of everything um, through a filter of whether it likes Europe or doesn't like Europe. Well, I saw a disinformation expert uh, basically tweeting that most the most uh, the most virulent disinformation in Britain just comes from like the Daily Mail and the Daily Express, and not actually uh, uh, Russian yeah. trolls on Facebook at all. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. De, Der Spiegel actually called the British press a fucking disgrace. In English, so there's this German <laughs> German article um, that, in the middle of it, goes a fucking disgrace. Yeah, man, contemptible human beings. Uh, Ian, let's begin uh, with the very big, the big picture, the TLDR top line on this agreement, um, because obviously we have had, including from our friends in the right wing press, a hell of a lot of spin. How would you you sort of frame this? for our listeners, um, if it's not, in fact, a a diplomatic triumph for Bojo? Um, Piss poor deal, even by its own standards. So, you know, even assuming you're going to leave the customs union single market, just in terms of things like sort of mutual recognition of qualifications or uh, conformity assessments um, or equivalents on sanitary and phytosanitary goods, the kind of things that the EU has in trade agreements with other countries like Japan, like New Zealand, like Canada, are not present in this deal. So on those terms, quite bad. On In terms of being more positive, the labor, environmental, and state age and state aid protections are in fact very, very strong. And although Boris Johnson will say this gives him the ability to diverge wherever he likes, blah, blah, blah. In fact, what happens when you diverge is you get hit by tariffs. And in a worst case scenario, whole parts of the agreement just get suspended. Basically, no deal. And that dynamic combined with the fact that this is looked at every five years, combined with the fact that businesses are going to be constantly saying, we need to stay aligned so we can keep our export costs down. We need to get closer on this so it's easier to do business. I think ultimately points to this deal being a base camp to which we are going to gradually, slowly, but maybe not that slowly, get closer and closer integration to Britain. Uh, to, <laughs> you see, I almost got to the end of that, having made it all made sense. <laughs> closer integration towards Europe. Yeah. So an, an ever closer union. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hooray! <laughs> Alex, we predicted uh, for months, really, we said, so, well, okay, if it's, if it's not going to be, if it's not no deal, then what it's going to be is a deal in which Johnson makes some uh, major concessions, but spins it as a triumph. And obviously there's a lot of people willing to help him spin it as a triumph. Yeah. Is this effectively what, what he's done? And what are those concessions? What we said from the very beginning was that uh, free access to the single market necessitated an alignment of rules. And you can't have an alignment of rules without some uh, way of monitoring and policing whether the rules are aligned. 
you know, the technical way by which you achieve this was always open to a fudge so that, you know, the, the British government could claim it as a as a victory and say, look, we have nothing to do with EU law, we have nothing to do with ECJ. And yes, th- those terms have been excised from the treaty. But the mechanism for checking that there is alignment, including penalties for when there isn't alignment, is still in the treaty. It's also all one treaty, which is a major concession Mm -hmm. by the UK, because they wanted it all to be in separate treaties. This was one of their their, um, aims from the start. What I find really interesting is that I haven't seen almost any assessment of the deal with the the notable uh, exception of Martin Wolf in the FT that also includes the withdrawal agreement. And I think that I think that's quite weird because the withdrawal agreement was the first chunk in which the EU basically got exactly what it wanted on the three issues that were its central priorities. We now have a trade agreement in which the EU again has effectively got what it wants on its next priority, which is the trade in goods, because the EU trades more goods into the UK than the UK does to Europe. And what's left outstanding is services, including financial services, which is actually the UK's main area of concern. So, so what there's been, uh, it, I think the the sequencing of it is the thing that reveals more than anything the the relative negotiating power of the two sides. Because basically, the EU has gone, nope, we want to talk about these things first, and the UK has gone, all right, here, have them. And then the EU has gone, okay, now we want to talk about this thing. And the UK has gone, okay, let's find an agreement on this. And what's left outstanding is all the stuff that the UK really wanted to talk about. Can I, yeah, I, I think that's completely right, by the way. And, and in fact, you can see this dynamic all the way through Brexit from 2016 onwards of the UK trying to silo issues and just take them on their own terms. And the EU constantly pushing to say, no, we, we talk about everything at once. Um, and that's important because it, it highlights the leverage that the EU has. And that was a, a major dynamic in this negotiation. When you get to the end of it, you see why. Because on things like fishing, if the, if the, UK, the UK says we can stop anyone from coming into our waters, and indeed they can, they will have the right to do that. But look at what happens if they do. Not only can the EU put up tariffs on fish, they can put up tariffs in other areas. And then if it wants to, It can just start suspending parts of the agreement. It can suspend the whole of the agreement on trade, but it can also suspend parts on things like transport, you know, things like aviation. And that is the sign of what the EU does. Very, It does exactly the same thing in the EEA agreement for countries like Norway. Going, fine, well, you can fuck with this if you want. But, of course, we're still going to be able to just suspend this pillar. And it's just wielding that huge might that it has by having that very broad spectrum of arrangement in order to get the the smaller partner to do what it wants. It's it's what the EU has done before, and it's what it managed to do very successfully throughout the last four years, and especially in this deal. Ian, there's something that that, that I'm wondering is is sort of how, as a a Remainer, I should feel. So you sort of say like a a piss-poor deal, but it also seems to be one in which, therefore, the EU has has made sort of... um, you know, has, has has got a lot of things that it wanted. So how do we not as the, we're not the British government, we should be, but sadly we're not. Um, <laughs> but as, as Remainers, how should we feel, should we therefore feel good that the, the ways in which that is somehow a sort of, you know, the places in which perhaps you could say that Britain has failed is actually sort of good for us because it means that we're not as distant from the, the EU as, as we might have been had they been more successful. Like how, how do we grade it in terms of our interests? No, I know exactly what you mean. And it's pointless being, it would be absurd for me to fucking sit here and be like, well, let's feel great about this. This is all fantastic. Because look, th- this is a fucking disaster. And, and I feel more emotion for some, January the 1st is starting to take on more of an emotional toll on me than I had anticipated it would. Because, you know, it really is the end, right? At the end of Article 50, the end of transition, you really, that really is the day we're out. And that is kind of weighing on me. Um, and there's no way that we can pretend to be happy about it. And the kind of deal that we've got here is about as shit as we could possibly have conceived it to be. Like, I mean, it just, it is absolutely fucking terrible. It's a hard, hard Brexit. The thing is, we've known those two facts, you know, that January the 1st is going to happen and that we're going to have hard Brexit for a really long time. What is new is looking at the structures that the EU managed to get the UK into. And on the basis of those, 
I feel relatively upbeat, you know, given the fucking circumstances, where <laughs> you, you just think, what are the dynamics? What are the trends, right? They say they're going to diverge. They've got the right to diverge. They want regulatory competition. And I'm certainly the case for the next two, three years, you know, this, this government is going to try and come up with instances of doing that to placate its, its ERG law. However, look at it medium to long term. Each time you diverge, you get twatted by tariffs. You get parts of this deal suspended. You've got every five years, you have this review of the deal, which essentially sets up a situation where every new political generation, you know, every new parliament in Britain, every new commission, every new sort of um, president of the council, you get this reappraisal of what's going on. You have all the drive from business, which is constantly want to reduce the price of exports, which is constantly want to be aligning with Europe. You have all these opportunities to just integrate further. And the deal, the framework for it is constructed in such a way as for it to be a living agreement, you know, for things to be chucked onto it. The next stage will be sort of uh, data adequacy and uh, possibly equivalence of financial services. You just keep on chucking stuff on. When a Labour government comes on, it might chuck on Erasmus. It might actually want to join something like the Customs Union. All of that is there. And I think the dynamics are there for this to be the start of closer integration rather than, than further distancing. So it's kind of a, it's impossible to say we should be happy, but there are concrete reasons to think that this is the start of us going back rather than the end of us leaving. And I would say that this is actually the real victory of the Johnson government and the May government before it. It was to pivot from a point where they were touting the easiest deal in history that would be all upside and uh, would give us the exact same benefits of membership to the uh, uh, single market and come to a position where they can now claim it was some sort of Herculean task that Remainers said could never be done. No <laughs> Remainer said it couldn't be done. We were demanding a deal from day one. <laughs> we were demanding a soft... And, and yet you, you get people, everyone, from sort of Nick Timothy in The Telegraph to Brendan O'Neill in, in, in Spiked just to, to run the gamut of, uh, <laughs> you know, far right to far, far right. Um, you, you get people saying, ah, you said it couldn't be done. No one said it couldn't be done. Well, well no, we were saying... We were saying for God's sake, get Do a deal. It. We don't want no deal. No deal is terrible. And then these people were going, no deal will be fine. And now that and no deal has been averted, exactly. they go, ah, ah, now there's a deal. You didn't want that. It's like we literally did. I mean, it wasn't, you know, obviously also essentially wanted to reverse Brexit. But, you know, short of that, of the two options that were on the table, this is very much the one that we wanted. And, so and it's, it's, yeah, well, yeah, let's go WTO. What, what, what about those people? Exactly. And now they're touting the deal as worth 660 billion. I have no idea where that figure comes from, by the way. And I don't, I, I, papers and news, TV news have been repeating this figure of 660 million billion. Um, I don't think anyone has fact checked it. I have no idea where it comes from. The government's own assessment of membership of the European Union was that it, it was worth topside 90 billion a year in direct trade. So I have no idea how they get 660 billion with a deal that will obviously impede trade, make it less than it was before. But there, there you are. That's the dominant narrative. The dominant narrative now is, by the way, don't scrutinize this because you're being so, so losers and now's the time to unite. So we were in a situation where for four years we were saying, don't scrutinize what the government is doing because it's unpatriotic. It's mm -hmm. a difficult time for the UK and we need to be behind the negotiating team. As soon as that's turned into a deal, so the first chance we've had to assess what was promised in 2016 versus what was delivered this year, they're saying, don't scrutinize it now because, you know, it's water under the bridge. So when does accountability happen for this massive, massive constitutional change? Mm. Mm. I, I think you'll find it happens between uh, 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. Uh, on Wednesday in the House of Commons and no later. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that satisfies you. It seems more than enough time to me. Yes, yes, I think so. <laughs> No, we're trying to a nightmarish world where any criticism that you can make it seems to be met with, uh, well, this is why you lost the referendum in 2016. <laughs> and it's just like, I don't like that! <laughs> um, 
<laughs> anyway, um, one thing I want to clarify, because I think we have been talking, whenever we've done the how is the deal going, and basically putting uh, Naomi in particular into a kind of nightmarish groundhog day of the mind, um, <laughs> we've, we've constantly said, look, there's these three areas, right? So there was like fish and uh, level playing field and state aid and governance. And I think, therefore, that listeners who have not read the agreement some lazy people uh, like myself um, might um, <laughs> might want to know uh, just very briefly what happened on those three things because we had week after week after week of it just going they're not budget we can't you know we have no deal because we cannot budge on these three things so can can I get the two of you between you to kind of explain briefly what happened on each of those issues so I'll start with you in and just go level playing field state aid what was decided who won? There, I mean, there are no, there's definitely no winners here. Um, the state, I mean, look, to briefly tell you how this works, you know, state aid is when you're subsidizing your industries in a way that's unfair to competition with others. Um, what the EU was trying to stop with that and with the environment and labor was Britain basically being able to go around the world and go, look, we've got tariff free access to, to the single market. Corporations come here. We're going to cut all these regulations. You can pay, you know, you can pay fuck all, you can pollute the water, whatever, but you still get all the access you get in Europe without having to abide by those regulations. That's what they were trying to stop. Britain was trying to say we could do whatever we want without having to check with you guys. The opening position for the EU was pretty draconian and they stepped down from it rather quickly. Arguably, it was just a sort of tough opener. Just basically to say you're going to abide by completely by EU law as it updates on state aid and the environment, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that will have come under the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. The UK government obviously wasn't going to accept that. The UK's response was, we're going to do nothing apart from the standard WTO stuff on subsidies, which, which are actually not dissimilar to what you end up with, um, but much lighter, much milder. And saying, we're not going to accept any, any, anything that you tell us about having our own domestic enforcement or blah, blah, blah. Where they ended up was where the EU has been since about sort of April, um, basically since the early summer where the EU said, look, we're, we're going to, they tacitly said, we're not going to ask for you to be part of, you know, European law, but what we are going to insist on is domestic enforcement, an arbitration process, concrete arbitration process where we can impose tariffs on you in other parts of um, this treaty. Uh, it's not quite true that it's gone for other parts of the treaty. It's just other parts of trade. But nevertheless, the EU basically got what it wanted at that point. So once you do something that the other side considers a breach, let, you know, let's say on state aid, say you're subsidizing, you know, I don't know, high tech industries and, in, you know, wherever Britain's Silicon Valley is going to be, <laughs> then at that point, the EU can go, fine, we're going to impose tariffs on you um, in retaliation for that. Then just as quick as the tariffs, you get um, uh, the mediation process. Again, well, were these tariffs fair or not? If they agree that's fair, then they, they carry on. If not, then, then you try and work it out another way. And that's about it. You get a, a secondary level of this, which is called rebalancing. And that's where after a certain period of time, if one side thinks there's been significant divergences, that's a quote, significant divergences, they can do rebalancing measures in, in tariffs. In other words, if there's been too many breaches, you can actually go, well, okay, fine. So we're, we're clearly on completely different courses here. We're going we're gonna to respond to tariffs. Or you can actually suspend the agreement, trade, and again, transport. And don't underestimate what, what that means when we say transport. You know, that's the aviation agreement. That's the thing that is keeping those planes going. So again, then you see if, if they start to go too far in one way, that kind of sort of no deal threat, Ribena no deal, sort of comes into the picture again and just says, well, we can bludgeon you with this. Sorry, that was quite long-winded, but that's a, a pretty accurate sort of summation of, of how it ended up. Alex, do you want governance or fish? Um, <laughs> well, governance was always part of a uh, level playing field, to be honest. It wasn't a separate issue. It was basically how you monitor um, compliance with a bit of the agreement where you had alignment. I, I mean, I hate to say it, but I tweeted I, three years ago uh, that you can constitute a tribunal together and call it Bob. Um, it, it doesn't really matter. The point is there is going to be some sort of external body. But um, a, a, a win on the British side is that the, the prima facie assessment, the, the first assessment of whether you're breaching those rules will be a domestic one for both the EU and the UK. So mm -hmm. that's a win. Um, on fish, I think, you know, if you look at the reaction of the fishing industry, 
uh, people like Andrew Locker, who is the chairman of the National Federation of Fishermen's Organization, you know, he's saying he's angry, disappointed and betrayed. We sort of knew that was going to happen. We tried to warn people, but people wouldn't listen. Um, it, I mean, the UK started from a position saying, no, we will keep all our fish, went to 80% of our fish, went to 60% of our fish, and have ended up with 25% more over five years, at which point we'll talk about it again. Um, so that, I think, is, is a significant loss. But I, I, I think more than that, if you take a, a sort of if you take a slightly more holistic view, I think the EU come away from this with their main objective intact, which was to find a way to safeguard the integrity of the single market, and more than that, to make it clear that there are huge benefits to membership. Mm -hmm. So if, if you boil it down to one thing, that is the thing. They can come away with Barnier saying, life outside the European Union is hard. Do not think that you can somehow have cherry pick the best bits. And it's going yeah. to go on. I mean, I suppose being part of the EU, in essentially, that's not that's never that was never a done deal because, of course, there were always kind of um, yeah. new new things coming up and new arrangements uh, and, and reforms within within the EU. But but now outside, where you you are basically looking at a kind of an infinite Brexit, in which it's just every few years you've got to renegotiate this and that, and and if you go out of line on this, then you can be punished and. It's sort of it's not as it's being presented. Like, well, that's the end of that chapter. It's just sort of yeah, which which was what it was always going to be. Because as we've, as we've said again and again, the the one factor um, that is merciless and that you can never ever go around is geography. This huge market that is actually the closest market to us geographically, it was always going to end up in a process of drifting closer to them little by little again, however hard the Brexit that, that happened was. But, you know, everyone is relieved now because everyone thought, oh, my God, we're going to bumble into a no deal. But relief is a fairly transient political consideration. I mean, in a year's time, we'll look back at this and we will see the the most regressive trade settlement between democratic nations there has ever been, because there's never been a, a, an occasion in the past where two bodies, two entities got together and thought, we have a really free-flowing deal now, let's gum it up, hmm. let's make it more difficult. That has never happened before, not willingly. And so, you know, this is a, a horrific moment for the country. But, you know, Michael Gove pops up on the Today program and says this was just extraordinary. He said that forcing companies to do more paperwork will make them match fit for exporting outside the EU. So forcing a government, forcing a company to do more paperwork will train it to do even more paperwork that we have no idea whether it wants to do. Do you remember um, when red they... tape was bad? Do you remember when you <laughs> red tape was bad? No and, longer. And, yeah, and Brexit was explicitly sold as something that would lessen bureaucracy and regulation. And was that a lie, he... Alex? <laughs> 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 and, and now Did they lie? Pop... No, the fucker now pops up and says, we decided basically to put training weights on the economy at this moment of profound recession and the pandemic. And this is a good thing because imagine in 10 or 20 years when we take the training weight off, we'll be really fast. Before we move on to the, the politics of it and actually how it's going to pass through uh, Parliament, uh, Ian, I just want to ask you quickly about something that was there was a sort of a big issue uh, on Twitter and amongst a certain sector of the population, um, which was Erasmus, which doesn't seem to me like it was one. It was never one of the big sticking points that people were talking about. Oh, when are they going to sort out Erasmus? And Britain has just sort of withdrawn from that. And the suggestion seemed to be that that, 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 that was a sort of an unnecessarily sort of petty uh, thing to do. What, what's your assessment of why that happened? Oh, I mean, I literally just take it as read, just take what they said, which is they just thought it costs money. So we're not going to do it. I mean, you know, he said he was going to stick to it. 
it, they decided they cost a bit too much money. They pulled out of it. I'm sure that ultimately their disposition is if you can get out of it, get the fuck out of it. You know, they don't want any part of it. You know, you go back even under, you know, Theresa May, the idea of leaving something like the Aviation Safety Authority, Yasser, um, was just for the birds. Like no one would ever talk about it because you're just like, well, what? No, no one in aviation thinks you can accomplish anything by having your own regulator. It just doubles up all this work. And now suddenly you're doing that too. Why? They can't give you a practical reason why. They can just say, Basically, Europe equals bad. Therefore, anything that is your, you know, you just want to get the fuck out. And that's, I presume that plus the money is just why they just thought we'll get out of um, Erasmus. I mean, I don't think it's any more complicated than that. They really are just as small minded and tiny hearted as they appear. So let's talk about how this is going to go through through the commons. Starmer sort of announced that uh, that Labour would uh, support this before he could possibly have, uh, have read it. Why? Why did he not just sort of wait and make it seem as if he was going to, you know, play a little hard to get, be a little flirty, but then pull back? <laughs> why, why, why did he just, uh, why did he just sort of go, go, go all in before, before sort of inspecting the detail? Yeah, and that involved a bit of a, a bit of a lie from Starmer, really, if you think about it, because you know, for for weeks we've heard from the Labour leadership, oh well, we obviously need to see the deal, you know, before we can come up with an answer here. Then the deal. It emerges that a deal exists, but no one's seen it yet. You know, this is just hours after sort of Boris Johnson. It, it was like an hour after Boris Johnson had come out, and then someone comes out and says, "We're going to vote for the deal." And it's like, okay, fine. I mean, I get the politics, but let's not claim that the story you have told over the last few weeks has any consistency whatsoever. Um, I think it's motivated by, and I don't blame him for this, by the way. Um, I, I think it's motivated by an idea of just minimizing Labour's role in what's happening. Now, the deal is going to pass. It is going to pass. So the question then is, what do you do to make sure that there is as little chatter about Labour during this period as humanly possible? Um, And making sure the Tories own it. In fact, you can get that just by virtue of the speech that he made when he said he was going to vote for it, where he basically said over and over, I'm going to make you own this, I'm going to make you own this, I'm going to make you own this. Um, So really, I think it was just the news was there you're about to go into Christmas. It was just a quick bit of almost paperwork just to go, we're going to vote for the deal just so that's there. Most of the stories will be about the deal itself and off we go. And was there any risk, do you think, that if they didn't, if Labour decided to abstain, that there would be enough kind of dissatisfaction among the ERG that it, that, that it, would, that it would fail? Was that ever a motive, that there was a real fear that, that actually yeah, Labour they, had to back it? They made a statement this morning saying that... Uh, it, this morning being Tuesday morning, Mm. saying that Sir Bill Cash will deliver the verdict of the star chamber they've convened, um, chaired by that intellect, uh, that supernova intellect, Sir Bill Cash. So they'll deliver their verdict this afternoon, um, in which they uh, they will announce whether the deal is, and I quote, sovereignty compliant. So pompous. I've never seen a more self important bunch of in all my life. I the really Star haven't. Chamber will proclaim. <laughs> I hope oh, no. you dress up. I hope you like my... it. <laughs> I think they should dress up like all the characters from He Man when they do it. Especially Bill Cash. I want him wearing the He Man outfit in full. There's no chance that they were going to, I mean, I don't, there's nothing, no evidence that the numbers would suggest that this was going to, this was going to fail. I mean, th- there is a distinction though. I think there's, a, there is a moral distinction. And as you know, like, I don't really, I don't think it's a big deal whether Labour votes for it or abstains. I do think it's wrong to vote against it. I mean, that seems like a real problem because that essentially to me, in practical terms, is a vote for no deal. That is the consequence of how the vote would play out. But then it does follow, I think, on abstention that even though the numbers aren't there right now, you're supposed to vote by what by by the outcome that you are trying to secure. And it follows that if it's wrong to vote for no deal, it will be wrong to abstain because you're opening up the possibility of no deal. And I know the politics of this is fucking grim and awful. And most people I know, and for, for very, very coherent, cogent reasons, feel another way and think you should abstain. I, it just seems to me that that argument for no deal does permeate the argument for abstention, because ultimately, if you're opposed to no deal, you try to stop it from happening. Um, and so there's a sort of sort of slight complacency to, to the counter argument, I think. Yeah, it's difficult. It's basically like a teenager has climbed out of the bedroom window and comes back 
blind drunk and the parents have no choice but to let them in the house and go, we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about this tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically what's happening right now. They're going, yeah, all right, kid, get in, get to bed and we'll talk about this tomorrow. Is it too late for a second referendum? <laughs> <laughs> well, really Shut up, idea. man. Don't play with our pain. <laughs> just, just checking because that would be good. Um... <laughs> Another thing that that sort of strikes me is that there has obviously been criticism that a lot of people are going to vote on this, having not read uh, thousands of pages of of this agreement. But uh, Ian, uh, as a kind of, you know, regular Westminster watcher, I mean, is this this unusual? I mean, for, for, for sort of MPs to vote on something that they perhaps not have fully read? Or is that no. just the way that it's the way that they work? Yeah, they do that all the fucking time. Um, and they just do what they're told and they vote the way that they're supposed to. However, there's usually an awful lot of mechanisms around legislation to make sure that it does get scrutiny, right? You know, I mean, there's all sorts of sort of subcommittees and they go through it line by line and there's committee stage. And that takes a long time. And the reason it's supposed to take a long time is because, you know, people are supposed to bring, tease out the problems with it. So the people who oppose it hear their arguments, think, can you reflect any of that? I mean, this is, I don't want to be too, you know, idealistic and pretend that it always works so beautifully in that way. But at least there is a sense that you're supposed to give it time and structure to find problems. Now, mm. you're not going to do that over five hours, halfway through Christmas and New Year's on a Wednesday morning, you know, and, and, it's almost, it's, there's almost a sort of flamboyance. There's a sort of almost pride to the lack of scrutiny that it's getting from the government, as if that's a sign of their, you know, as if that's them flexing their biceps. And without any comprehension that it runs completely contrary to all of the principles that they supposedly espoused during the referendum about parliamentary sovereignty and, and, and people taking back control. So, uh, of course, that blights, and MBs often haven't read this stuff, but usually th- there would be considerably more scrutiny than this. And it's embarrassing. I think really genuinely embarrassing for us as a country that this is the manner in which we're doing this. It feels just, I just feel so, I feel so very weary and, and powerless pointing out that, you know, things like, but you said you cared about this, and now it turns <laughs> out you didn't. And you promised <laughs> yeah, this, because- was, this would happen, and now it hasn't, as if that's going to make any difference at all it's just like i'm go- i'm gonna send w- a tweet that will send shay- tremors of shame throughout the conservative party and they're gonna go have you seen have you seen dorian's tweet he pointed out that that i said something and now i'm contradicting it and i do you can't know live what, with that dorian do you know what though <laughs> this sort of assessment will come and it will come in four years time and it will come at a really instinctive level because what was promised was actually quite specific. It was a sense of control. It was a sense of freedom, a sense of leveling up. The uh, the problems of Brexit, we know, and we're about to see them. You know, so we are about to see uh, more difficulty going on your holidays. We are about to see more problems if you have a pet that you want to take somewhere. We are about to see queues of lorries. So all of that will go into the uh, category of that happened. And then in four years' time, I think there will be a question that will go out to people, and it will be basically, do you feel in control? Do you feel more in control? Do you feel freer? Do you feel as if a great weight of regulation has been lifted? Because if you don't, then all this has been for nothing. And people will know in their skin how they feel. So that assessment will come. It just won't come at an intellectual level in a tweet. But, you know, what's happened over the last couple of weeks is that, you know, the EU have lost basically one of its least enthusiastic members, uh, one of its traditional hecklers, while, you know, keeping the UK's nuts in a vice to squeeze whenever they want some concession out of it. And so I hate to say it, but the EU have taken back control. Finally, when you're talking about things that, that, that perhaps will, you know, that stuff will be scrutinised, perhaps, you know, when it's too late, but people will will start noticing various aspects of the deal, I'm going to give you both a chance to dig in the crates and and pull out a deep cut from the trade agreement that um, that you think has perhaps been overlooked or you think is actually going to become much more of an issue? So I, I think there, there are a number of little things. First of all, immigration. Brexit was sold as a solution to immigration. The 
latest statistics for immigration were out yesterday for the past year up to March. Now, obviously, they will be impacted by the pandemic, but that doesn't; those figures don't include that. So immigration, net migration went up to 313,000, up a third from 221,000 the previous year, almost as if there's something else moving migrants, mm-hmm. almost as if there's a demand for cheap labor in the UK, and migrants coming in simply fulfill that. When that continues to be the pattern, that will be a big, big problem for the people who sold Brexit, I think. Mm. Ian, I think something's being overlooked at the moment. I mean, let me, let me, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm going to almost answer the opposite of what you're saying. So I'm going to go for the big headline piece, but I think it, there's a slight, we, we haven't quite recognized just how big a role it's going to play in our lives. And that's uh, the Joint Partnership Council. Okay. So this is right at the heart of everything. The, all these, it's about over 30 sub councils, most of them focusing on a spe- specified area of the agreement, they will feed into this thing. But the Joint Partnership Council is ultimately, where the conversations are going to take place between the EU and the UK in the years to come. Now, what what really fascinates me about um, the mechanisms on disputes that you see all over this agreement is that they're really not loosely worded. They're really quite specific in a lot of cases. And they, they, they look like they're the kind of things that are expected to be used. They look like mechanisms people have thought hard about and thought, this is not some theoretical exercise. This is going to happen. How is it going to work out? And on that basis, that Joint Partnership Council, I think, is a, is, a, is, a, is a name that we're going to hear an awful lot of over the years to come. Mm. I mean, a lot about. And it's going to be the site of these battles with the Brexiters pushing one way, with the rest of us pushing the other. That right there is the forum in which the future of this debate that we have been talking about for the last four years is going to play out over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and these, you know, if you're hearing these words for the first time, remember this moment because I swear to fuck, and I'm so sorry to say it, you're going to be hearing an awful lot of them in the years to come. Uh, the Guardian called it bedsit independence, which I think is a, just a brilliant. <laughs> so, I mean, that's as, that's essentially it, isn't it? We're free, but we're living in a bedsit, and, <laughs> and the, the daily reality of that will, you know, we, we we're a middle aged guy that's put out a profile on Tinder asking for for girls with a maximum age of 22 and now we get to see whether we have any responses <laughs> um, and and the reality the reality of what happens may not match up to what we thought would you know it's been a while since someone came up with an absolutely golden brexit metaphor on the podcast, but you just fucking did it just days before it's all we leave you there we go <laughs> Uh, well, thank you so much, Ian and Alex, for interrupting Chilmers for, uh, to discuss the deal. I just wanted to say that we keep saying we've read the agreement. I mean, I've read bits of it that were interesting to me and skimmed the rest. Uh, oh, cool. So I, I feel like we need to offer thanks to, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. People like Stephen Pierce and David Allen Green and David Henning and Anton Spicek and Professor Caldwood, Dmitry Grozubinsky. There are mm. so many people who put in the hard work over the last few days so that we can, you know, record a podcast and be smart and sharp and pithy, hopefully. Um, but really, we owe them a big debt of gratitude. Very strong agree. Absolutely. And if you're yeah. if you're interested in these issues, I would take the list of names that Alex just read out and just go follow them on Twitter because you will learn more about what's going on by following like those six or seven people than, than you will any other way. Except by listening to us. Don't talk. <laughs> Stop talking oh god what now down, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you want us to succeed? <laughs> So thanks, Ian and Alex, and thanks to you for listening to our special emergency trade agreement podcast. We'll see you next time. (laughs) 